Thank you. Um, let me just tell you a little bit of, a more, a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to comment on our table topic, whatever it's called, table topic, for just a second, because uh, as we started to talk, I started to have flashbacks of, of public relations. Um, I have worked for the Larry Miller Group since, well, since Larry bought the first half of the Jazz, uh, April 11, 1985. Um, I started with the Jazz in June of 1983 with Sam Battistone. And we had uh, 11 and a half employees. The half wasn't a short, it was just an intern. Um, but and today, the Jazz has over 85 full-time employees. So it, we grew a, a little bit back then. But you also have to remember that we, we were playing in the Salt Palace. Um, 12,666 uh, was the attendance, uh, sellout number. Um, we didn't reach that very often. In, First years that I was there, uh, we would often announce six or seven thousand, and, and people, you know, you looked around. You know, we got people to put their coats on the chair next to them. That really helped them look better. <laughs> and honestly, we were out to lunch. Um, this would have been um, probably about in 1984. Frank Layton was coach and general manager, and we were coming in from lunch. Um, if you remember well. Some of you aren't old enough, but right across the street from the Salt Palace, where it was, um, Aeropress Square, there was a restaurant called Two Guys from Italy. And uh, they liked the jazz, so we gave them all the tickets they wanted. They gave us all the pasta and salad and soup we could eat. And so we were coming back from there with Frank Layton one day. And the phone, as we came in the, the office, the phone was ringing. The receptionist had stepped away for a minute. And so Frank picked up the phone and said, Utah Jazz. And the person on the other end of the phone says, what, can you tell me what time your game starts tomorrow night? Frank said, what time can you come? <laughs> Meaning, you know, you might double our attendance, so we'll wait for you. <laughs> so I was at the Jazz. I started there as director of marketing. And then when, uh, we hired uh, Dave Chekis as executive vice president. We made some other changes. and. I held three, several titles. When I uh, was last at the Jazz, I was Senior Vice President of uh, Marketing and Sales. And um, I had the opportunity to accept an assignment from the LDS Church for three years in 2005 uh, to go to Pennsylvania. And when I called Larry to tell him about, he, he said, well, come talk to me. And so I, I, no, I called him to say, I think I need to talk. So when I walked into his office, he said, I don't know what we need to talk about. He said, go. And I said, well, I'm not sure about some things. He said, well, you'll have a job when you come back. I can't promise it will be the, the same executive level or same pay. I can't, you know, he said, but uh, you'll have a job. I'll take care of your health insurance. I'll take care of your life insurance. And I'm going to pay you $200 a month to be my consultant. And the reason he did that was he didn't want me to lose my employment tenure. So we rolled that $200 into the 401k to keep it going and active. And um, so I remained an employee for the three years that I was gone. When I came back, Larry was in the hospital and uh, had just had that, the heart attack. And I wasn't prepared for that, having worked for him for a number of years and worked closely with him. Um, and he asked me if I, would, I was prepared. I was, was calling me three months before I came home, about um, every two weeks. And he kept, we would talk, and he would say, I, I know what I'm going to have you do. And I said, what am I going to tell you? And that was Larry. That was, um, and uh, so he said, but we're going to have fun. And, and he, he hinted at creating, you know, this board of, of advisors from within. And when I went to see him after, uh, just at the day after I got home, he was in the hospital, and uh, he asked, he said, I want you to, to uh, be part of the corporate office. He said, well, eventually we'll transition Greg, um, but uh, I want you to be there. You, you've been with the, we've been with the group a long time, and I need you to see the other side of what we do. So I did, I, and he said, um, this is on a Wednesday, and he said, uh, can you start Monday? And I said, well, I know. and for those, 
after kind of doing what I was doing for three years with uh, you know, 130 19 to 22 year olds, um, it, I was hoping I could get a couple of weeks of sleep. But, um, anyway, we uh, I worked it out that you know, I'd start a week later. And, uh, so he called me after being there two days. So I went on on Wednesday and he called me. I think it was on a Thursday. And he said, how's it going? And I said, Larry, something's got to change. And he said, what do you mean? I said, we're just, everything just seems plugged. And we're just, because you're not here. Larry was a very hands-on operator. Um, he, uh, you know, had probably 27, 35 direct reports, if you will. Technically on an organizational chart, maybe they didn't, but the way he operated, people just didn't do things unless they kind of it went across Larry's desk. And so things were really kind of clogged, and I could sense them. And so he asked me, and I said, people just can't seem to get things done because you're not here to, to move it along. So the next morning he called me and he said, are you ready? And I said, what, four? And he said, I met with Greg last night. This morning we're going to announce that he's going to be the CEO and, and take my place. And we'll announce you as the executive vice president. And I said, okay. And we, we went forward. And it's, it's the, the company has... You know, has gone on um, amazingly well. Larry was incredibly smart, and I don't know if it was intuition, if, it, or if he was just blessed, or he just understood. But in, 19, in 2007, 2000, late 2006, 2007, he started meeting with his boys um, every Friday at the end of the conference room down at the uh, arena. I have to say arena because it was the Delta Center to me, and I, I haven't got used to saying Energy Solutions Arena, but it's getting there. Um, and uh, so they met at the arena in the conference room every Friday. And the very first meeting, Larry handed out spiral bound notebooks to all the boys and said, You're going to want to take notes. Yeah. And uh, he started, you know, and then he would just talk and he would just tell them why he buys real estate the way he does, why, does, why he acquires dealerships. Why I overpaid for this dealership? And we, and we bought this one. It wasn't, you know. I, all my advisors said, "Don't buy it." This is why I bought it. Now look where it is today. This is why we do what we do in giving back to the community. And so, quite honestly, uh, Greg was ready. He had run three different dealerships. Uh, we're, and Greg will tell you, we're an automotive company. You know, we you know, we have the jazz, and we have. The bees, and we have a sports track, and we have theaters, we have sea stores, but we're an automotive company. Because of that, we can do some of the other fun things. <coughs> and uh, so, uh, Greg was ready, and um, but he also it was also visionary of Larry to kind of create this advisory board of some of us who had been around, and uh, and in the first year and a half, Greg really used it to be able to, to kind of settle into that comfort zone. And we were, we were meeting weekly, and then it went to monthly, and then it went to every other month, and now we're quarterly, but which is plenty of meetings. But he has settled in, and a completely different um, management style. And I told you before, Larry was very hands-on. It was one of the things that frustrated his relationship with Dave Checkins. Because Dave Checkins came from the corporate world, where things went through channels. And Larry would call and talk to anybody he wanted to, including those who reported to Dave Checkins. One of those was me. And give them directions and assignments, and, and then it could be kind of frustrating. But once you learned the system, you were OK. Greg's style is to have five or six direct reports, give them their charge, and then I don't hear from him unless I need him or he wants a report. He doesn't get in my way, he doesn't go around me, he, does, he, he just wants to get it done. And so he's, he's, a, he's a little bit, he delegates and, and expects it to get done. So, um, and Gail, has, uh, being part of that transition, uh, has been a, a real blessing. Um, she adds wisdom and um, just very wise. She'll sit in our meetings, and if somebody from the outside would say, you know, 
She's just kind of taking, you know, she's just listening. Oh, she, and she is. But, and, and she, when she speaks, she won't say a whole lot. But it's just full of wisdom and full of, you know, you, you may want to pay attention. Not because she's the chairman or the owner, but because uh, she's got some real good sage advice. And it's been wonderful to work with her. And I had the chance to work with her. Probably as close as anybody except for the, the Miller boys. Um, let me just touch on for just a minute. To, I don't, what do we go to? I told Brad, I said, I think this goes till noon, right? Um, no, no, no. I, I really liked the, the topic on the table, the public relations, and we, talk, we chatted about it a little bit. You know, and, and public relations is so, so much more than just what, you know, press releases and media, media relations. And the league set a great example of that um, years ago. Public relations, it was called public relations, but it wasn't. What it really was was media relations. The PR directors of the league um, really were responsible to make sure that the news anchors, the sports reporters, the beat writers from the newspapers and the, and the radio sports stations got their interviews, that, they, that the locker room got open at the prescribed time after a game so they could do their interviews arranging one-on-one -on -one interviews if they were requested by media, making sure that the, those writers had their places at the press table during a game, uh, distributing press releases to the media, the sports media, but it had nothing to do really with public relations. It was all sports media relations. And so uh, the, the league started to propel, and, and as I, we were really one of the founders and one of the pioneers of taking public relations really into a more of a community relations spirit. We had to. Um, the, when I made the decision, uh, I was with Sam Battistone. We hired Dave Chekets in August. He started September 1st of 83. He took a leave of absence from Bain and Company. I took a leave of absence from the ad agency I was with. Because we weren't sure. I mean, you know, the, the, I told you how bad the attendance was. And, Anybody remembers way back in the day, Sam Battistone, every June, had some kind of press conference announcing something he was doing to try to save the whale. You know, one, one year we sold Dominic Wilkins to the Atlanta Hawks for a million dollars. And if somebody can tell me the two players we got with him, I'll give you two lower bowl tickets to a game. With you. <laughs> John Drew and Freeman Williams. But what, they really, what Sam really wanted was the million dollars. Uh, the year before that, um, they traded um, the draft pick before they even got to the draft to the Los Angeles Lakers for Gail Goodrich and Cash. That draft pick ended up being a um, player to see who might remember him, uh, Magic Johnson. Um, so the, the local, you know, our research told us we really don't believe you're going to be here very long because you keep doing stupid things. And um, they were right. So Dave and I weren't sure that we were going to be there very long, and so we just took leave of absence. We didn't commit long term. Um, and of course, that all ended when Dave uh, bought the team, or when Larry bought the team. Um, so we went into junior jazz, and in 1984 we started. We we picked up something that the uh, players association had started, but not very well with the YMCA programs started running Junior Jazz, and, and that really became our community relations program. We also developed a community relations program of putting, you know, taking the player appearances. The players have to, by contract, give the team so many appearances in the public. And we started using those to go to schools and do assemblies and go to hospitals. And you see this team still carries on that tradition of going to the Shriners and Primary Children's Hospital at Christmas time. And that's, part, that's really public relations. The other stuff we were doing was really media relations. And um, we, then we, we started doing, going around with a van and through neighborhoods and replacing nets on hoops that were out front of, in, in people's driveways. Uh, we started to replace them in areas that needed basketball playground equipment. We started putting basketball uh, courts in some of the playgrounds. One, 
We've done several now. We, that, that through very many charities continues. So, I, you know, and I think that today we talked about at our table with social media. You've got to, you know, if you're if you're a big company or a company with any kind of public prominence, you got to be paying attention because, you know, back in the day they used to say that, you know, an upset customer will tell ten people. Happy customer will tell three, but that was before Twitter and Facebook and, and texting. And you know, somebody walks out of your dealership or out of your restaurant or out of your store, and they just had a bad company, bad experience. You know, one tweet or one post on Facebook, you know, just hit you know 350 people or more, depending on the followers. So you have to be really careful. We have people who monitor um, our name different uses is on all the different um, social medias so that we can respond and we've been able to kind of, we've been able to turn negatives into positive when we when we find out that somebody's tweeting Larry H. Miller you know just uh, I, I just had a bad experience with Larry H. Miller you know, uh, theaters or the, the Honda store or and we can we see that we get it back to the manager they're able to call that person immediately and say, really? You, you thought the popcorn didn't have enough butter? No. Or, <laughs> you really? Anyway. Um, and, but, or have our general manager from one of the dealerships call and say, I understand that you, you felt like you had a bad experience. Please tell me about it. They're, you know, obviously, they're, they're on their heels because they don't know how you know. But they're all, and they're also kind of taken back to you and take time to call. But, you know, public relations is, uh, is very important. And uh, some people say, well, as long as they spelled my name right. Well, that, that's kind of, that's old school because it's just, it's so, you know, the example. And, and people are like salmon in a stream. We, and at the first of the football year, the fans were all behind the replacement refs because of what they were demanding and what they wanted. You know, screw the officials. We can do this without them. What are they saying today? <laughs> what happened Monday night? And so, you know, your customers and the general public, you, you know, you just never know where they're going to be, so you've got to be careful. Um, one of the things, uh, so, some of the things that I'm overseeing now is all of our real estate um, in, for the Miller Group, uh, and that includes construction of new dealerships and, and buying, real, buying and selling real estate, corporate relations, community relations, which that's my involvement with the chamber, which I'm very you know, pleased to be involved in, have been since 2008. Um, probably the thing that's the most fun is I get to work with the, the company and the family on philanthropy. Excuse me, I head up what we call Larry H. Miller Charities, which is the employees uh, have an opportunity through their paycheck to donate to uh, our charity. Each of the entities donate to the charity, and then we have subcommittees, and the money all goes back into the markets, whether it's Idaho or Spokane or Albuquerque or um, And uh, we have a little board that, that meets. I sit as an advisor with the family on the Family Foundation, and then uh, I sit with Gail um, probably once a month or more often, and, and we review requests. Watch the great you know, kindness of her heart, and uh, I just—I told her the other day. I said, you know, I can't go with you everywhere, and you know, I just need to keep people away from me. We've got—we need to budget this. Thing. But and I called the president of one of the universities who I know very well, and I said, enough already. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she's so kind, and and there are things that are done. I have always been, even with Larry, there's things that are done out in the community that people have no idea. And there's things that are done that, that I don't know anything about. I see the checks, but, I, you know, but I'm not sure I know where to go to. And there are little things that, uh, you know, um, some, you know, many people in this community can be grateful that, that Gail and the Miller family watch the 10 o'clock news many of them were recipients from their travesties and their unfortunate situations because there was something reported and, and their heart was touched and the next day the check was mailed. 
many times um, either I or my assistant were asked to go get a cashier's check so that people won't know who the money came from. And, uh, it's, it's fun to work for someone who believes in giving back. Um, I'm going to save just a few minutes for questions and answers because sometimes that's where all the best stuff comes from. But the Larry Miller Group, um, people here may not understand, we're the 10th largest auto dealership in, in the nation. Uh, we have dealerships in um, Washington and Oregon and Idaho and Utah and Colorado, New Mexico and Arizona. And um, since Greg's Greg is driven to grow. We have, we have grown um, since uh, his uh, taking over as excuse me, the CEO. We've added uh, probably uh, eight or ten dealerships um, with his leadership. Uh, we are currently looking at um, several more. Uh, it's been it's getting tougher. I'll tell you that in 2009, 2010. It was fun fishing uh, because uh, there were those who weren't prepared for the downturn and didn't have their, their um, they weren't in good shape. They weren't prepared for it. Larry used to always, 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 we would go as sports entertainment people, sit in the back of the room to these two-day meetings that Larry would have, and it was always automotive. So we, we understood we were an automotive company. We were the fun guys. but. Um, and, but he would always say, and he was talking to the, the, the auto group, we got to prepare for the rainy day. You've got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. And he would pound it, he would pound it. Even during good times, you know, when, the, when cash was just kind of seemed to be you know, printing itself, if you will, for the auto world, he would say, you've got to prepare for a rainy day. Well, when 2008, 2009 hit, we were ready. Um, from 2008 to today, we had one month where we had brackets at the bottom of our financial statement. One month. So, um, and uh, where we had to take cash reserves and, and you know, fill in that month. Every other month, you know, we have been profitable. Profits weren't as big as maybe they were in 2006, 5, 2005, 2006, 2007. But, um, but we were profitable. We also had reserve funds. We had, we had debt was paid down. We didn't have debt on any unsecured assets. And so that we were able to grow our company and be able to you know, make acquisitions because there were those who needed to get out, had to get out, and we were prepared to be able to do that. Um, we've had theater growth, which has been interesting because one of the first meetings we had was, you know, should we get out of this business? Uh, when I got back, we looked at it and said, you know, with all the home theaters that are going in, with Redbox, with, you, you can order movies through Xfinity now, you, are, are we in the right business? Are we in the right business? Do we want to, are we concerned about the content that's coming out? And um, just you know, flipped just the other way and said, look, Nobody does it as good as we do. Um, sorry if that sounds prideful, but um, we really believe that. Um, and we aren't afraid to tell the studios, we're not going to show that. We can't do that on every one. We are not. We can't be the community censor, but if something's extraordinary, you know, we'll stand up and tell them we're not going to show that. And they can, you know, the other guys can do it, but we won't. And so we have grown. And uh, we just opened the one in Centerville. Where just added two more screens at Jordan Commons that will open the week before Thanksgiving, where the Mayan used to be. Um, we won't even go there. <laughs> um, that's another half hour all by itself. Um, and we're building uh, some more screens out at Valley Fair Mall. If you take I-215, you can see the construction there. And then we just purchased a, a small theater chain with, that had some screens in Mesquite two or three complexes in St. George, Cedar City, and Logan. And uh, we're putting the Megaplex touch on those. It's going to take, it will take a while. It's going to take lots of polish. But uh, we're growing the theater experience as well. We have over $100 million of planned 
construction and real estate on the books in the next two years in all the markets that, that we're in. And we have grown the fan stores, uh, the, what used to be, well, they've been big fans long enough that nobody would know that they used to be called Pro Image, but um, we have grown them uh, to now over, I think we're, by the time Thanksgiving gets here, uh, we'll have about, I think, 75 or 78 fan stores. And their growth markets have been um, basically NFL markets. Um, it's, uh, let me just share with you, that it's just, I thought it would be interesting. I thought this morning, you know, if somebody was to ask me, what have you learned in your career? And I, I, I jotted down um, four things. Um, and one is hard work. And you, you can't replace there isn't anything that replaces hard work, in my opinion. Uh, I've got a great example. I have a, a, a senior vice president of, of marketing and, and ticket sales for the Jazz. is a gentleman by the name of Jim Olson, who I hired, almost didn't hire, because he was too qualified. I was looking for a phone room manager. I, we had a dungeon downstairs with um, eight uh, tables and chairs and eight phones. And I just needed somebody to kind of manage some part-time people to phone out and to sit by the phones so that I could have hot rods say, you know, we have tickets available tomorrow night's game, you know, buy two, get one free, call 355 done right now. And I needed somebody to manage these kids, and Jim Olson applied. He had an MBA from Boston. He was working for Fidelity. I said, I, said, I can't hire you. I want you, but I can't hire you. He said, just give me a chance. I said, you can go somewhere else and get 20000 more than I'm offering. Just hire me. Just give me a chance. And he kept calling me. And finally I said, look, you're signing your own death certificate, but that's fine. <clears throat> well, his hard work you know, has propelled him to, into you know, five or six different promotions within our group into where he took 50% of my load when I, when I left in 2005. And that has just done well. And the family loves him, the management loves him, because, but because of hard work. It's not because he had the MBA. I guess better to be careful with educators here, but, but that, that gave him some smarts, but it was his hard work. His, to contrast that with, I have a friend who graduated from the University of Utah with an MBA, walked out, kind of buttoned his, his coat and said, hire me. Kid hasn't had a job other than working for his father, busing tables at the restaurant uh, in seven years been in rehab twice. He didn't, it wouldn't work. I told him, I said, look, good. I'll give you a job. If you're going to start as a ticket salesperson. You're going to be commission only. I'll give you $1,000 a month for off for the first two months. No, no, no. The MBAs average sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. Good luck. Well, he wasn't willing to work. Second thing is take care of your people. Um, I learned that by working with Larry. Um, takes care of his people, and um, I have been taken care of more than one time. Kind of closely related to that is loyalty, and loyalty goes both ways. And I was honored one time when, excuse me, I guess in honor of Larry, I'm going to have a cheer. Um, when, Larry, uh, when Larry was asked by someone, um, so if you describe Jay Francis in one word, what would that be? He said, loyalty. But that's, that went two ways. I mean, uh, the loyalty he showed to us for, to be able to let us leave for three years but come back and have a job uh, was uh, more than I could ask for. And then um, give back. Maybe that's, maybe we can't all give back with our checkbooks or our or cash, but we can give back in the community and we can, we can serve others. And when we do that, we become better people. We, we become better managers. We become better employees. We become better husbands, fathers, sons, daughters. So, you know, that's uh, something that I have also learned from the Miller family, the Miller group. That's why I, you know, I, I served with the chamber. Last night I went down with my wife with the group and we served the homeless. And you can, you know, you come away from it. You know, I've done that four or five times now come away from that thinking, 
know, as I'm driving down, we're talking to a couple people, and I'm complaining about the construction in my backyard, and that I can't use my deck or my hot tub because the dust is just too prolific. Coming home, I said, at least I have a backyard. So you know, when we go out and we serve, it, we kind of recognize that maybe things are, you know, are a little bit better for us than we thought, and uh, we just become better people. If there are some questions, I'd be happy to. Not so much questions or comment. Two things. First of all, if anybody in here hasn't read the book, what's called Driven? Driven. One of the most fascinating books I've ever read in my life. This Larry story. And then secondly, probably the best kept secret in the state is Nord Motorsports Park. If you haven't been out there, it is a world class facility. And somehow people think because it's 20 miles west of downtown, and it's, you know, but it is just incredible to go out there and as close as you can get and get back in the pits and the staging areas. I mean, it's just, you can't go do that anywhere else. So I think he talks about it in the book originally. They planned on spending a few million dollars and ended up about 85 million or something like that. So, but did he say that about the way you guys wrote it for him? <laughs> yeah. I was, I'm was. i like, who is this guy? I need a <laughs> Writing on a $20 bill helped. Well, <laughs> I got a friend from Phoenix that races Vipers across the country. And I watched him a couple times. and just an incredible experience. Just, you know, well, well time spent. It's, um, that was one of the last public relations things I um, did for uh, Larry before I left was the groundbreaking of what the track was going to be. And he told me what it was going to be. It's going to be this little country club track, a few garages for, you know, guys that have their own Ferraris to be able to have a garage, and their mechanic can work on it, and they can go out and race around, maybe host a race here or there. And then I kept getting, you know, emails from people inside, and we went from, yeah, I think he was going to spend about 18, 12 to 18 million. It was over 100 million. The good news is it's paid for. So, had a tour out there, and the guy that gave me the tour of the museum was kind of saying that it, it, looking forward, he was a little concerned that it would hang around. There's a lot of money tied up in cars, sitting on four wheels, doing nothing other than sitting on four tires. What's the future of that museum? Oh, I think the future of the museum is, as long as Greg and Gail are alive, um, the, I don't think there's going to be, uh, in fact, I think they just added to it. Substantially, uh, so with a yeah, uh, with a huge number, it, it, it made the media. But I'm not going to comment on it. But so I, I think that it, I, it's too much of a legacy. I think things would really have to get tough. Would really have to hit some tough times for that to happen. So, it, and it, if you haven't, there there is some great legacy cars that yeah, you know, We just held a, a charity bike ride out there on Saturday and, and did a lap around the track and then. Some bikers went 100 miles, some bikers went 60, some went 30, some went 10. <laughs> That's all, I, it was tough being in charge of an event. And my two sons went 30 miles. But, uh, but there's lots going on out there. It's, it's, and it's starting to get some additional traction. And the, the staff out there has been phenomenal creating events. Great for corporate, um, corporate events, team building. Um, you know, rather you do the, you know, you, you can have your, your employees uh, challenge each other and who can change the tire the fastest. You know, they'll, do, they'll, they'll let you take the tire on and off of Mustang and pit crew challenge. Or you can challenge each other on the, on the car, which is go to the karting experience. It's really fun to, you know, run, run your boss off into the dirt. <laughs> <and it's laughs> Accidental. <laughs> Look at your dealerships, uh, Jay. How is that distributed? Do you have more Chevy dealerships or Honda or? Uh, we're probably, uh, our, our two heaviest is Toyota and, and Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram. Um, in fact, we're so heavy in the uh, Toyota, in what they call the Denver region, which is uh, Utah, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona, that uh, three years ago they, they required us to sell one. Pick one in the in the Phoenix market. It wasn't in Phoenix, but the Phoenix market, which was was hard. You know, giving up a Toyota is almost giving like giving up a, a grandkid. 
<laughs> uh, and then Chrysler Jeep has, has done well, and, and we've been able to, in acquisitions, be able to grow there. Um, we're not as big as we'd like to be in Ford and Chevy, but we're always looking. Um, Jenny, I, I had a question about, I mentioned that you were
and to add the staff and, and the professionalism that having Stan Parrish as our president, he would love to be here. No, he wouldn't. He's enjoying <laughs> biking in Italy. So he's, he's um, he and his wife are riding bikes for two weeks in Italy. So uh, I hope I have that much energy when I stand in Italy. But uh, the staff, you know, Javine is phenomenal with the, our events, and uh, she's done, as you witnessed here this morning, and, uh, and with Ryan and Sarah, we've really got a, a great staff here. Thank you for letting me come.